Today we've got a great service planned for you. Uh, very shortly we will have some worship. We'll also have communion. So get your juice and your biscuit ready for that. And we'll also be hearing from the Word of God through the preaching. Before we get to that though, on the right hand side of your screen there you will see a chat section where you can say hi. Somebody's there to have a little bit of a conversation back with you. For something a bit more private, uh, do hit that request prayer button and you'll be taken to a private chat where somebody can pray with you and you can speak a bit more confidentially. Uh, school is back tomorrow, which means all of our programs are all back as well. Kids Church will be on next Sunday. Um, youth will actually be back on on Tuesday night, so that's exciting. Uh, we've also, all of our life groups will also be back. Uh, next Saturday is also our monthly prayer meeting um, from 3 to 5 uh, on Saturday, so um, check that out as well. There's so many events happening, so to keep up with them all, the best place to find out what is going on is actually our social media. So check out Facebook, um, you can check out Instagram where all our events are listed. Speaking of social media, we're also on YouTube if you want to catch up on um, other um, services, so check it out there. We've also got a podcast on Podbean and also just recently you'll find us on Spotify. So you've got many ways to, to find us and to catch up on some services if need be. So very shortly we'll actually be hearing from Professor Steve Fogarty who is the president of Alpha Crucis College and he'll be bringing the, pre the preaching to us today. We're very excited that he's here and um, really thankful that he's come to share with us today. Alpha Crucis College is actually our denomination, ACC Churches um, College, and a lot of the people in our church have actually used Alpha Crucis College to do their Bible college, so we're really happy that they're here today. Um, Alpha Crucis' mission is to raise up Christian leaders to change the world. So uh, get ready. We'll see you afterwards. Bye.
Well, hi church, it's my privilege today to share the communion message with you. And I'm going to read from a couple of passages. First one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth and he's saying to them, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He took bread because by taking the bread, he was saying, I'm going through with this. He said to them, this is what he said, verse 24, it was the Passover. So they were always having this Passover meal, which involved taking bread. And he goes on and he says in verse 24, and when he had given thanks for the Passover bread, which was representing the night they left Egypt and came into freedom, he broke it and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And they're going, what do you mean? Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup. And I've got one of our little communion glasses here today. Take, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm, I'm showing you how to remember my sacrifice in the years to come. This cup now represents my precious blood. And in the years ahead, I want you to keep doing this to remember and remind yourself it was my precious blood and my broken body that became the sacrificial lamb for your sin. And he, go, he said, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Next Sunday, we will be having another memorial service, but, but it will be an Anzac memorial service. And I have here a, a piece of paper that's got the name of my great uncle on it, my mother's uncle, George, George Divin. My mum's name was Jean Divin and uh, her uncle George was 22 years old when he went to France to fight in the Somme. And on the second day, he earned a medal. He took a bullet and was killed on the second day of being in the war. First, he survived the first day, did not survive the second day. And so the family received this plaque from the government to remind him and say, thank you for giving your son for the freedom of our nation. And so Jesus gave his life for the freedom of God's people. Bible says we are citizens of heaven. Heaven was fought for. Everybody in heaven who are already there and all of us who are going to be there, somebody fought and died to defend our rights to be there. And that was Jesus, our Saviour. He fought for us. He fought against sin. He fought against the plans of darkness and he gave his body and he gave his precious blood. And we say these, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he come. God said to the people of the Old Testament, every time you come, don't come empty handed, bring an acceptable sacrifice. That's why we hold this in our hands today. We are holding up before God saying, God, I'm trusting in the broken body of Jesus and I'm trusting that his precious blood is pure, clean and holy enough to remove all my sin. And when I ask for forgiveness, it's sufficient to wash away my sin. And God says these words. He said, I will remember their sin no more. I will forgive their sin. Hebrews 8 God says, I will forgive their sins. I will make a new covenant. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Eight, Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. I will. I want to say 
as you take your emblems today, thank God, somebody died for you and you're going to have an inheritance in heaven with him in the years to come. God bless you and let's partake together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, you sent Jesus for us. Thank you, Jesus, you came and died for us. Thank you, Lord, that your blood is sufficient to cleanse all my sins, all my sins. And you said, I will forgive their sins and remember their iniquities no more. Amen.
never ending reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights to the left and leaves in 99. I couldn't learn it, I couldn't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never. Hello Dolby Christian Family Church. It really is a privilege to be able to share this message with you this morning. And thanks Pastor Murray for giving me the opportunity. I actually look forward to being with you in church on Sunday morning. Well, I might look a bit overdressed uh, to share a message in church these days, even though a couple of decades ago this is how we would have dressed. Uh, but I've come from a funeral today where we celebrate the life of one of our wonderful uh, academic staff here, a wonderful woman. And it was just inspiring to hear all the stories about her faith and her diligence and her impact upon other people. So she's in heaven. And, uh, and we all look forward to that with a glorious hope. Well, I want this morning uh, to think about um, the gospel. And I'm going to use the book of Romans and I'm going to use, of course, the writer of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, if I was to introduce myself to you, I'd probably tell you a few things about my family and about my background and about my present job, and it would orient you to who I am and help you to understand me a bit more, and that would help you to understand the message I bring you as well. Well, the Apostle Paul does this in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, he sort of gives a, a biography, a sort of a biography of himself. You'll find similar things in the book of Philippians and in the book of Galatians. But in Romans 1, he introduces himself to the Romans, uh, probably for the first time, because he didn't start the church in Rome. So he's introducing himself to the Roman Christians uh, with the desire to share his understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his bio, his biography uh, that he gives in chapter 1, is all in relation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, here's how Paul describes himself. In verse 1, he says, he's a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So that's his basic descriptor, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. He goes on in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 1 to say that he is obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish, and that he's eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. And in verse 16 he says that, He's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So think about this biographical introduction of the Apostle Paul. He's a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel, obligated to Greeks and non-Greeks, eager to preach the gospel, not ashamed of the gospel. What a fabulous way to introduce yourself. What a fabulous way to understand yourself. Uh, Paul's life is thoroughly tied up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's identity is uh, intricately connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He describes himself as being set apart, obligated, eager, not ashamed in regard to the gospel. He's supremely confident in the gospel. He's supremely confident that God is working powerfully through the gospel to lead men and women to salvation. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed to preach the gospel. His life is squarely based on his overwhelming confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you feel a resonance with Paul because Pentecostals, conservative evangelicals, we have a similar understanding. We believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer for humanity, for individual people, for families, for towns, for societies, for nations, for the world. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer. And our identity and our mission, our, our raison d'etre, is tied up very carefully with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul was not ashamed to confess the gospel, to preach the gospel, because it's the power of God that leads to salvation. What a fabulous word. Fabulous phrase, the power of God that leads to salvation. Uh, the gospel is God's power for salvation for many reasons. But in the book of Romans, I can pick at least three. It's the power of God for salvation because 
it confronts us with our sin, number one, because it comforts us with the offer of forgiveness, number two, and because it challenges us to transform our lives, number three. The gospel is the power of God for salvation by confronting us with our sin, comforting us with the offer of forgiveness, and challenging us to transform our lives. I want to think about each of these just for a moment or two this morning. Firstly, the gospel confronts us with our sin. The gospel announces that everyone has sinned and stands guilty before God. Everybody. There's absolutely no hope for any person being declared righteousness before God on the basis of their own merits. You can't earn favour with God. You can't do enough to win God's favour. And this is spelled out really clearly in Romans 3.23 where the Apostle says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have failed. All have missed the mark and fallen short of the glory of God. And of course, there's a big biblical picture behind this statement. It starts with the creation of Adam and Eve, created in God's image, created uh, very good by God, created to love God and walk with God in the garden and to serve God, indeed to obey God. And you and I know that uh, that pristine creation, that wonderful initial relationship between God and Adam and Eve and uh, within all of creation is damaged uh, by that, that act of rebellion, by choosing to do what God asked them not to do. And so we find from Genesis chapter 3 onward that the human condition is one of alienation, alienated from God, our creator, uh, alienated from ourselves. Uh, we never quite seem to find what we're looking for. We never are able to heal ourselves, never able to be completely whole, alienated from one another. It doesn't matter how advanced our technology and our civilization has become, uh, we still can't get on with each other. Uh, wars and rumours of wars never go away. And there are probably more wars being fought today than at any time in history. And of course, alienated from creation. We were created to uh, look after a pristine creation, a garden in Genesis chapter 2. And of course, it's not quite a garden anymore, is it? So the Bible's picture overall is that um, we are damaged by, flawed by, impaired by sin, by a disconnection with God, by disobedience with God, and, and, and we're biased away from God. And nothing can change until we respond uh, to God's call for us to deal with our sin. I committed my life to Christ in Townsville, actually, in 1977, on the 15th of May, 1977, a very, very long time ago. But I came from Perth, and I went back to Perth the following year, 1978, and I went back to university. And the year before I committed my life to Christ, in 1976, in my first year of university, I, along with a group of friends, had uh, taken on a dare to steal some chairs and a table, an entire setting from the bar of our local hotel. And, uh, and so we did it, and we were surprised we got away with it. Uh, I stole a chair from the hotel, and I put that chair at my desk at home where I would study. I was doing a degree in economics, and I'd sit at that chair and write my essays and submit them. But after I committed my life to Christ and I came back home uh, and tried to sit in that chair and do my essay, I just couldn't concentrate at all on my essay because my conscience uh, was troubling me. And God, the Holy Spirit, was speaking to me. Uh, continually, uh, you need to return this chair and confess your sin and, and make reparation for what you've done wrong. And finally, I gave in and I rang the hotel and told them the story and said, I want to bring the chair back. And, and uh, they said, yeah, please do. And so I brought it down thinking I'm going to get charged or arrested or something. And of course, when I brought the chair in, they just laughed about it. And it was a minor thing to them. But boy, it was a big thing to me because it was the consequence of sin in my life that had to be dealt with before I could get on with my life. So having given the chair back and uh, feeling right with God again <coughs> and putting a new chair at the table, at the desk, I was able to complete my economics degree. Uh, the gospel confronts us with sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, we're told in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. So our initial response to the gospel is to acknowledge our sin and to seek forgiveness, indeed to make reparation if God challenges us to do that. The gospel is the power of God 
because it confronts us with our sin. It doesn't let us hang out in mediocrity. It doesn't let us deny what we've done wrong. It challenges us significantly and strongly. It confronts us with our sin. And that's the beginning of the healing journey of salvation. The gospel is secondly the power of God for salvation because it comforts us with the offer of forgiveness. See, the gospel announces that a righteousness from God is available to everyone who will trust in Christ Jesus. We can be declared innocent. We can be declared acceptable to God if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose from the dead on our behalf. We've just uh, celebrated, remembered uh, these momentous events uh, over the weekend of Easter, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle says in Romans 3, verses 24 to 25, that uh, all are justified freely by his grace. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. That's Romans 3, 24 to 25. If you think about uh, Ephesians 2, you have a similar idea that, that we are saved by grace through faith, uh, not of our own works. It's the gift of God. Salvation is received by faith. Salvation is to receive God's forgiveness, is to receive cleansing, is to receive new life. You see, again, there's a big biblical picture behind this statement. And, and we're told that uh, by the Apostle Paul that Jesus, uh, the Son of God, is the second Adam. The eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, became man. God the Son became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And we're told not only that he died on our behalf, but he lived this human life. He retraced this human journey. He was tempted in every way like you and I, yet without sin. So he lived this life the way it can be lived. He was innocent. He was blameless. He'd done no wrong. And then he died this human death on our behalf. The innocent died for the guilty. The one who'd done no wrong paid the price of the guilt of those who had done wrong. On the basis of that, God is able to offer us forgiveness. See, the gospel announces that we can be freed from bondage to sin and to the law, our attempt at self-righteousness. Sin won't be our master anymore because we're not under law. We're not striving to prove how good we are. Rather, we're under grace. We can be assured of eternal life through the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul spells this out very carefully. It's such a joyful, triumphant chapter, Romans 8. And in verses 1 to 2, the Apostle says, Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's the beginning of chapter 8. And at the end of chapter 8, the Apostle celebrates the fact that nothing can separate us from God's love demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. He says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's uh, Romans 8 verses 38 to 39. The chapter starts with there being no condemnation because we're in Christ Jesus and ends with this wonderful declaration that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit enables us to live as children of God. And you know what children know? Children know forgiveness. Uh, they enjoy the love and the embrace of their parents, even of their grandparents. I've got five grandchildren. The other day I was at my son and my daughter-in-law's house and, and our youngest grandchild, young Harry, who's two years old and full of life, a bit of a tornado, came into the dining room where we were with a little bouncing ball that he bounced around the room on and promptly took that ball and raised it above his head and whacked it right down in the middle of the dining table, smashing several plates, several glasses and damaging all of our dessert. And uh, what did we do with Harry? Did we uh, punish him severely, put him out the back? No. No. Uh, Harry looked at us and he said, sorry, sorry. And immediately we all forgave him and cleaned up the table and got on with our dinner. And Harry was not punished. 
Now, if, when he's a bit older, if he does that, there might be a few stern words, but he'll still be loved. He'll still be accepted. He'll be still drawn into our embrace. And of course, uh, that's what the gospel tells us. If you say sorry, if you accept and confess your sin, God will forgive you and wrap his arms around you. He'll draw you into his embrace. See, our experience of forgiveness convinces us that God's love can't be defeated. Nothing can defeat the efficacy, the power of God's love in your life. Well, the gospel is the power of salvation because it confronts us with our sin, because it comforts us uh, with the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. And finally, the gospel is the power of God for salvation because it challenges us to change our lives. Harry's too, he's got to grow up. And as he grows up, we'll expect more of him. And the Apostle Paul spells out this process in the book of Romans. In chapter 12 particularly, he talks about this. He says that our minds are to be renewed. He says we're to serve in humility. We're to love sincerely. We're to submit to authority. We're to walk in holiness. We're to exercise our Christian liberty for the edification of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to dwell in unity. We are to act like adults. We are to grow up. We are to be transformed as we respond to God's grace given to us in Jesus Christ. Now, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. I'm sure you've heard these verses many times. The apostle says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renew, renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. I urge you to uh, read that passage again and think about it very, very carefully. You're forgiven, wonderful. God's at work to transform you. The apostle said to the Corinthians uh, that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ are being transformed from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ by the Spirit. This Christian life is a life of transformation. Therefore, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Apostle goes on in chapter 12, verses 4 to 5, to talk about our interaction with one another. And he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it dilig diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. And he's just talking about the fact that every one of us has different uh, passions, talents, traits, uh, characteristics, behaviours. Dedicate what you bring to the table to God and use it for the benefit of the rest of us. Uh, we're to be transformed in our mind, in our attitude, but also in our behaviours, in the way we interact with one another. The outworking of the gospel in our lives is that we serve others with the gifts that God's given us. Now, all of this service contributes to our mission to proclaim Jesus Christ. As we serve one another and as we serve his creation, the world, the society we live in, it contributes to our mission to proclaim Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the Apostle Paul who wrote this had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest, to persecute, to try and wipe out uh, a belief in Jesus Christ. And uh, of course, he was knocked off his horse and, uh, and um, it cries out, who is it? It's Jesus Christ who's encountered him in that place. And he goes into Damascus and receives the Holy Spirit and is commissioned to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, uh, ultimately reaching you and I here on a Sunday morning. And the result of this encounter with Christ is Paul's conviction that he's set apart for the gospel, obligated to preach the gospel, eager to preach the gospel, not ashamed to preach the gospel. Uh, he believed that God had equipped him and called him and given him the passion and the drive uh, to be an evangelist for the gospel of Jesus Christ, an apostle and an evangelist. He encountered Christ dramatically on the Damascus Road, and then he wrote this letter that we're talking about today, the letter to the Romans. 
He had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. And he wrote this letter as an act of service, as a contribution to the church. Well, it's quite remarkable, this letter to the Romans, because um, I don't know whether you know, but Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, he was dramatically converted to faith in Christ while reading Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. He was converted by reading what the Apostle Paul had written as a result of his encounter with Christ. He was converted by Paul's gift of the letter to the Romans. Luther wrote a commentary on the book of Romans, including a preface. And a man called John Wesley was converted to Christ while listening to people reading from Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Now, what a fabulous set of connections. Paul meets Christ and writes Romans. Luther reads Romans and meets Christ and writes a commentary. Wesley reads Luther's commentary on Romans and is converted and, of course, goes out of the churches into the countryside and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. Uh, your gift makes a huge difference in the world. Your mature contribution to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the church of Jesus Christ, has an ever-increasing impact right across our society and the world. Hey, our mission as believers in Jesus Christ is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel is very specific. We hear lots of people saying they're Christian and they act in a Christian manner and they've sort of got Christian connections. But Paul's gospel is very, very specific. It focuses on Jesus Christ, who is God's provision for humankind's hopeless plight. In Romans, Paul says that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Let me repeat it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is a gospel focused on Jesus Christ, who died and rose again on our behalf. It's a gospel that calls you to confess your sin. It's a gospel that comforts you with forgiveness. It's a gospel that challenges you to transform your lives. It's a gospel that calls you to have your faith firmly squarely focused on Jesus Christ. So the gospel is God's power of salvation as it confronts us with our sin, as it comforts us with the offer of forgiveness, and as it challenges us to transform our lives. I encourage you to read again the book of Romans. It's such an inspiring articulation of the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ on our lives individually and on our lives corporately. And I challenge you to live in the light of the gospel. Like the Apostle Paul, let your biography, let your bio uh, be shaped by your commitment to Jesus Christ. Confess your sin, receive his forgiveness, be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, God bless you. I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Let me quickly pray for you. Father, I do pray for each of us that um, not only will we contemplate these words I've said, not only will we read the book of Romans, but we'll also encounter the Holy Spirit who will enable us to understand, to assimilate your word. Now let your word be life to us and change as we pray, as we commit ourselves to Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, team, and thanks too to Professor Steve Fogarty for your words today. We appreciate that you've taken the time out to share with us. So this is the end of the service. We just thank you again for joining us. We really hope and pray that you have a really blessed week. Uh, don't forget about life groups, signing up for a life group. You won't regret it. Uh, check out our social media so you can keep up with what's happening in the life of the church. And also, we'd love to see you live. So if you'd like to attend our live um, services, hit that book now button on Facebook and book in. All right, until then, we'll see you next time. Bye.